Hello and welcome to the RI Science Podcast. We're exploring how artificial intelligence is making its mark in the science world, following on from the 2023 Christmas lectures, which took us under the hood of AI. This episode, we're focusing on how AI is changing the world of healthcare specifically, and RI event producer Lisa is joined by Dr. James Kinross, a colorectal surgeon and lecturer at Imperial College London. James also has an interest in the use of AI and robotics in medicine, and his research project Indicate has recently been awarded over £500,000 in funding from the UK RI in their efforts to fund applications of AI in medicine. Before we dive in, please remember to leave this episode a rating and a review to let us know what you think of the new video format and to help more people discover the podcast. But for now, over to Lisa and James. James, thank you so much for joining me here at the Royal Institution. Um, so when we talk about AI used in the sciences, a lot of the times healthcare comes up as a major um, conversation piece. Um, and you've described yourself before we started recording as a surgeon by day and a researcher by night. So how do you see AI impacting these areas differently? So first of all, thank you very much for having me. It's a real pleasure to be here. Uh, so yes, I am a surgeon by day and a researcher by night. Uh, of course, that's not literal. I do do some research during the day and sometimes some surgery at night. Um, but I'm a clinical scientist. And so what that means is that I treat patients. So I treat patients with bowel cancer and I operate on them using advanced machines and technology and increasingly digital tools that leverage AI. And I'm a researcher because I believe that if we are to meaningfully improve outcomes for my patients and for everyone's patients, for and anyone watching or listening to this, we have to leverage science to improve the precision, safety and, and efficacy of those treatments. Um, healthcare is often held up as a kind of fundamental use case for AI. And that's probably for three main, pro, uh, three main reasons. The first reason is, is that a lot of healthcare is process driven. Uh, that's the way that we deliver care, both at an individual patient level, but also at a um, societal level. Uh, and wherever you have a process, a, a machine that uh, allows that process to be performed repeatedly and safely and in a standardized way is a very helpful and useful thing. So AI is, is, is really, really important in that regard. Of course, we have lots of problems with efficiency, uh, particularly in the NHS, and there's a great hope that AI will be transformative. The second problem that we have is a sea of data, we, which we are drowning in. Okay, so we produce petabytes of information too much for us to meaningfully use. And AI allows us to, or at least it gives us a tool through which we can begin to meaningfully interrogate that data and turn it into tools that have patient benefit or clinician benefit. And then the third thing is, of course, we still got a long way to go to improve outcomes for patients. So diseases like cancer are really quite complicated to treat and to fundamentally understand. And AI allows us to have completely new ways to conceptualize those diseases and to think about completely novel treatments. So actually AI as a therapy in its own role, is in its own right, is something that we're very interested in. Um, so in our previous episode of this series, we had Janet Thornton come in and describe the protein folding problem as the perfect problem for AI to solve uh, due to the huge amount of data involved. How does AI lend itself to he healthcare? So um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I had a meeting with quite a senior AI scientist at AWS, and we were supposed to be talking at that meeting about how we can use AI to improve the performance of surgical robots and perhaps measure how they function. But it became apparent that we had other priorities. And as early as kind of March 2020, we knew that there was going to be an infodemic problem. So we've talked about the sea of data, and that was brilliantly typified in COVID. We had a wall of information coming towards us, and we had no way of, uh, of systematically appraising that information and working out what was useful information or what was perhaps um, what you might call fake news, or perhaps even information distributed by bad actors. Um, and the problem when you have an infodemic is that that information could be subverted, it can be used perhaps in an unhelpful way. And we saw that in countless examples. 
So at the beginning of COVID, we started to think about, can we solve the infodemic crisis? Can we solve the infodemic problem? Uh, and we began to create some early methodologies that would allow us to do that. Ultimately, over the last three years, that has evolved into something more refined, which we now call Indicate. And Indicate is a project which we're so lucky to be funded um, uh, by the UK government to develop. And at its core, what Indicate is trying to do is to build autonomous systems for filtering through large amounts of information and to try and turn that information into something meaningful that a human can read, that is summarized, evidence-based, and actionable. So there's lots of examples of why that's very important. So policymakers need that when they're trying to decide which treatment is most effective for a group, group of patients, for example. So the National Institute for Clinical Excellence will, will do that. But similarly, clinicians need that information at a more kind of granular day-to-day -day level. So publishers will try and synthesize that information. And, and the process through which often clinicians perform that task is called systematic review. That's a process of a systematic search methodology. So can we say in a robust way that we've looked at all of the relevant information can we then quality assure that information? Can we identify the particular pieces of information that we need to really look at? And then can we robustly, taking into account all of the things that might confound that data set, like bias, for example, or poor quality, turn that information to something that we can summarize that says something definitive. So this drug is effective, this drug is not effective. And how do you think or how do you see Indicate progressing in the future? Well, we're really excited about it. <clears throat> and I think there's some fundamental things about Indicate which excite me most. The first really is a basic principle of artificial intelligence, which is that contrary to, I think, what you hear about AI in the lay press is that AI is just a tool. And although it might replace some jobs and it's gonna replace some jobs in some markets, really it's there to augment clinical practice. So it's there to um, be leveraged by clinicians, because I still believe even in a world of AI, you need people treating people. Um, and what we want to do with Indicate is to build a community, because actually a principle of artificial intelligence is that you have really high quality, what we call foundational data sets upon which you can build algorithms or methodologies for interpreting or analyzing that data sets. And we need a community of people to help us construct and build those foundational data sets, but also to then meaningfully apply the data that comes out of it or the tools that come out of it in their day-to-day -day care of people, right, of patients. And so what we're trying to do with Indicate is to, to build a community with us that help us create the foundational data sets and build out and validate those algorithms. Uh, and I'm excited that in the next 18 months, we're going to be able to make meaningful inroads to build that community. And that's kind of my major goal. I'm also really excited that we can start to apply it. So the journey of Indicate has been that we started with COVID data sets. So we ingested a bunch of COVID data sets into our, into our models. And then we were very lucky to get funding from the National Institute for Health Research and their AI program. And we started applying it to solving cancer problems. Um, what we want to do now is take some of those fundamental tools that we've developed in those fields and really apply them. So we're very lucky to have partners with NICE and with the BMJ, the British Medical Journal, and we're going to start seeing how these tools really work in the real world so that we can get a measure of their performance. Because ultimately, of course, these have got to be useful, right? If they're not useful, then there's no point in them. Well, it seems like um, a lot of people agree with you because you were recently awarded one of 22 grants from the UKRI, the UK Research and Innovation, uh, going towards the use of AI in health and research. Uh, how did this funding come about? So, um, like all good things in science, through lots of hard work, sweat, and a few tears. Definitely a few <laughs> okay. tears. Definitely a few tears. Quite a lot of rejections uh, and refining of our methodologies in our science. So, you know, we um, were able to put together a brilliant team. So, again, like anything in life, um, good projects come from good people. So we've got a core group of brilliant scientists, quite young clinician scientists actually, in the beginning parts of their career, who are very, who feel very passionate about the topic and really want to apply these tools uh, to make a difference. So we were able to build a very, very strong team, a core team. We obviously, as I've described, we had some. Um, 
we had a lucky break in that well it wasn't that lucky the global <laughs> pandemic was very unlucky but but during, at the beginning of the pandemic we had a very clear use case uh, and we had uh, access to some 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 help and some early stage seed funding that allowed us to create a proof of principle um, set of data and then from there follow on funding from the NIHR to build a what we call a minimum viable product so the the, the most the basic interpretation of the of the methodology that that, that proves the principle basically uh, and through a scaled series of experiments get to a point where we could prove to the UKRI that not only we had a compelling use case but actually we had the means to deliver it and that we could de-risk this very high risk uh, idea into a, into into something that they felt that they could support so with the mass amount of data that indicate needs and we've already talked about the progress in the future is there a chance that the project could start producing its own peer-reviewed papers or would it completely get yeah. rid of the people behind um, yeah. writing those things? So, so I believe that paper writing in its current format is going to die and that won't be the future of paper writing. I think it's going to fundamentally change forever and that generative AI will absolutely change that. But I think your question is very interesting because there's probably three different themes within your question. So the first is, is how do you build large language models based on medical literature when most of it is hidden behind firewalls or it's copyright protected? And um, we've seen lots of very large lawsuits for many of the generative AI companies because they've, they've perhaps used information to build their large language models by bypassing some of those systems. And we um, will have to see how some of those court cases pan out. But I think there is, a, there is an interesting question there about how we solve some of those problems. Medical um, science, or science in general, frankly, all science, needs to be able to build those in a way where uh, the people that own that data are you know, um, properly reimbursed and they, they see the value of those data systems, but actually we build future models that actually are able to properly leverage that information for the betterment of humankind. The second thing that you brought up, which I thought was very interesting, was peer review. Peer review, if you don't understand, if you don't, if you're not familiar with peer review, is the basic, um, it's the fundamental principle of all science, really. It's the idea that if you're going to present a di an idea to the community through a paper, or that your peers will, who are also experts in that field will review your work and make sure that what you're saying is robust and that you have you know analyzed that information in a, in a, in a way that is that is correct and that you haven't made you know errors or you perhaps haven't told or you haven't been economical with the truth which happens um, the problem with peer review is just not fit for, it's not fit for purpose it's not been fit for purpose for a very long time uh, it's open to abuse uh, people are not uh, re they're not rewarded for the considerable amount of time they put into it uh, and it's basically a, a system which really needs to be transformed and needs to be radically overhauled and AI is going to do that so peer review will absolutely change um, and I feel for the publication uh, industry for the medical publishing industry because they've really only just got over kind of the digital revolution of the internet which kind of transformed their business model in the early 2000s and now they're having to wrestle with AI and what it really means for their business and at the moment we don't have a kind of compelling future a vision of what that's going to look like. What I do think is that papers like systematic reviews, meta-analyses, synthesizing, you know papers that synthesize literature are just going to become obsolete. It's not a good use of any doctor's time, any scientist's time to be doing that. A machine should be doing that. It's a much better use of their time to be uh, meaningfully contributing to the model that underpins it or thinking meaningfully about the context of those models or the outputs of those models or um, applying those models. It's not a good use to be performing search. Like that's just a waste of your time. So, so and, and, and I think the inevitable extension of that is that generative AI will just write papers. It will write summaries and paper writing will change. And therefore the, the idea of authorship will change because 
actually that's also completely open to abuse i'm sure if you're a scientist listening to this you have been involved in a piece of work where perhaps you felt you should have been higher up the authorship than you really were and perhaps that senior author on that paper didn't really contribute quite as much as they possibly should well that needs to change that's that's been an abuse that's gone on for way too long and ai will change that because the contributions that individuals make to the development of those models will become much clearer they will become um, they will become more obvious uh, and in fact um, I don't know if you if you if you if you look at any paper today that's published on any meaningfully complicated science topic quite often the authorship list now is in the hundreds or thousands right so that in itself is an, an interesting challenge so I think this is going to transform medical publishing there is no question about that um, quite what that future of medical publishing looks like is an open question uh, and it will be interesting to see and i hope indicate makes you know a small contribution to pushing the whole field forward so how can ai speed up the transfer of scientific discovery to patient care well in its essence that is what indicate is trying to do uh, it's trying to take fundamental research and and sift through that big sea of data and identify the most promising leads uh, so that we can really focus on them and some of those might be what we call latent. They might be they might be quite subtle and hidden. Some of them might be making a lot of noise and be very easy to spot. But I think there's probably a more practical answer to that question. And genomics is a very good example. Um, omics means the high throughput analysis of molecular information, right? So you can look at genes, genomics, proteins, proteomics, metabolites, metabolomics, or metabonomics, or you can look at microbes, so mi the microbiome or microbiomics. And those all have a similar problem, which is that they're dealing with massive amounts of information, not just in a single genome or a single microbiome or a single proteome, but of course you're trying to study them across whole populations, so hundreds of thousands of people, sometimes millions of people. And that is a really big computational task. So I think you've heard about one of your previous programs about trying to use AI to understand the three-dimensional structure of a protein, right? That is a really complex task if you're trying to predict it from a gene. Um, and, and in healthcare, we're trying to exp uh, expedite that whole discovery process so that we can uh, take the discovery of a new protein or a, or a new gene or a new microbe and as quickly as we can turn that into a drug or a therapy or a medicine that helps that helps a patient. And AI obviously can help that process because it, it's performing lots of tasks that would take a human a very, very long period of time. It's very, very good at pattern recognition because that's what machine learning really is in its essence. But also, you know, true generative AI can begin to actually uh, analyze and interpret some of that information. Um, the challenge with that, of course, is that, and anyone that's worked on uh, machine learning or a AI will know this, is that quite often the tail can wag the dog at its basis, what I mean by that is, is that unless you've got a really good experimental design that's properly designed to answer the question or a proper representative cohort of patients with the problem that you're really trying to look at, or uh, you actually can turn that AI answer into a meaningful mechanism that you can reproduce and that you can actually prove, then it doesn't help very much. You know, AI is still the case that if you put useless information in you're still going to get useless information out right so so yeah i think it's going to have a really big impact on how you um how we begin to use things like omic scale information and turn that into meaningful therapies i think it's going to really speed it up i think in cancer that's a really good example i think you're going to see dramatic changes you're seeing funding bodies now want to fund ai research in that field for that very reason right uh, but again just to heed my advice on this, you've still got to have good experimental designs. And you see that with large language models, you see with every single AI system. If you're in my business in surgery, if, you, if your algorithm is based on the very best surgeons all performing brilliant surgery all of the time, it just won't work when you put it into the real world where average surgeons who aren't as competent aren't able to, you know, um, uh, aren't able to operate under the same conditions because the, the algorithm just won't be optimized for, for that environment. And the same thing applies, really. So, um, yeah, I think it's going to be really exciting. I think it's going to really transform how we use that information. What does the future of the operating room look like? Well, the operating room is changing very dramatically. I'll tell you a brief story. So when I was a very junior doctor many, many years ago, uh, they used to have music stands in operating rooms. 
And the purpose of the music stand was that you could place your operating, your surgical textbook on the, on the music stand. So when it was late at night and you, and you weren't quite sure what you should be doing, you could, you could, the nurse could change the, the, the page for you as you were going through the steps of your surgery. That is real, by the way. That really did happen. It's horrifying, isn't it? Comforting. Yeah. <laughs> so, so the modern operating room, of, I'm pleased to say, the music stands have long gone. And increasingly, it's digitized. So what that means is, is that surgeons are using uh, either uh, tools which are connected to the Internet of Things or they are using uh, tools which are leveraging information from the electronic healthcare record or connected to the NHS spine or they're using a sophisticated suite of sensing devices to make their surgery safer, right? And increasingly those are put on robots. So robotic surgery is... Uh, you know, it was previously a very expensive um, operative technique that was used in the minority of operations. The costs have come down. They're now more widespread and we're seeing them kind of used more frequently. And the driver for robotic surgery isn't really the mechanical advantage that it gives you. Of course, it does give you a mechanical advantage and it is useful. But I think the real value in it is that it is uh, a, a tool that measures your performance very precisely and you are able to not just measure your performance as the surgeon but also the team's performance around you and improve the efficiency the precision and the safety of the entire operating room environment so the operating room is really changing and and obviously a very big part of that change is also um, how we leverage imaging and x-rays and ct and all these sorts of tools and apply them in the operating room in real time so that you can give the surgeon uh, vision that they wouldn't otherwise have with the naked eye. So speak, you mentioned surgeons using computer vision. Um, what tech are you using to aid that? And could you give us an example of it? I'm very lucky. I work at Imperial College in London. I work in the Department of Surgery and Cancer there. And it's basically like being a child in a sweet shop. I just work with very smart people that have lots of really interesting technologies. And as a clinician scientist, that's, that's brilliant because it means that I can cherry pick those ideas and work with them to apply them to solving real world problems. Um, and of course, AI is a common theme through many of these projects because that is the tool that more often than not unlocks their potential because you're leveraging information in different ways to apply it to solving healthcare problems. So one of the tools, or one of the problems I should say that we've been trying to solve for many years is, is something called computer vision in surgery. So how do you allow a surgeon to see something that's not there? So I'll give you a good example. So a good example would be when you're trying to remove a cancer within a solid organ, how do you show the surgeon where the cancer is so that they can see it and then be sure that you remove the whole thing? So one way of solving that problem is augmented reality. And if you, if you don't know what augmented reality is, augmented reality sort of sits on the spectrum between virtual reality, which is a completely immersive virtual world that you step inside. So you wear a headset and all you can see is the world that's artificially created around you. Uh, augmented reality is a sort of um, extension of that, but it's a contextualized virtual reality, which means that you can see those virtual objects, but in the real world. So if you and I were wearing a headset and we were looking at a computer model of a brain, we'd both see it on the table in front of us. Extended reality means that we can then do something with that object. We can interact with that object or we can use it in a meaningful way. So the HoloLens 2 is a systems, an example headset. There are lots out there. It's made by Microsoft. And we started developing applications for its use during COVID. And in fact, we started developing it as a, <clears throat> as a form of digital PPE. You may remember at the beginning of COVID, no one could get the, 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 the prophylactic equipment they needed to protect themselves. So we made a completely digital PPE. And instead of sending a team of doctors into a ward, we just sent one doctor in with one HoloLens and it was very effective. And we were able to develop um, bedside multidisciplinary teams. We were able to educate undergraduates. We were able to teach doctors and it worked very well. And through that, we were then able to begin to apply it to surgical problems. Um, because we had a bit of momentum. And so what we've been trying to do is to use a HoloLens system to make surgery safer. Can the surgeon see what he or she needs to see in a way that they can't currently, and does that make surgery safer? And really what that is about is surgical navigation. 
can I get to this organ that I need to get to or this cancer that I need to get to or this disease that I need to get to safely? And, and can I get there efficiently? And um, can I make sure that I perform that procedure more precisely because I can see? And does this have an impact when you're uh, when you get to the patient patient facing side of healthcare, so do you find people feel more confident when they're talking to patients or is have you not uh, seen that effect yet? So I think if you've ever seen anybody wear uh, an extended reality headset, uh, you'll see it on their face very immediately. It's it's a very sort of visceral reaction. It, it's it's extraordinary really because it gives you a completely different perspective on the world. Um, and in a synthetic environment or a simulated environment or uh, outside of a real world, it's, it's, it's very, very impactful. But whenever you put these technologies into real world clinical settings, of course, things change a little bit because the real world is complicated and dirty and it's, um, it's less predictable. Mm -hmm. And as a research group, we're very interested in applying technologies like AI or extended reality into the real world because we want to have real world impact. <clears throat> and so we perform trials to try and do that. And that's a process because, of course, the key word here is safety. You want those technologies to be transformative, but equally you don't want to cause harm whilst you introduce them. So that means that we have to do that in a very controlled way, in a scaled way, and that takes time. And that's absolutely what we're trying to do at the moment. So earlier you mentioned that um, even though you're using this artificial intelligence, you still need a good team uh, behind it. So <laughs> you still need the people. Um, so we did a youth summit back in October. We invited some six formers in, and one of their concerns about AI was the loss of jobs in the future. So do you think this technology or this artificial intelligence, are there concerns about uh, jobs becoming obsolete, or do you think it's just going to bring in a different like variety of jobs into the medical field? So <clears throat> I don't think about it that way. I think about it in terms of evolution. I see an evolution of jobs. And frankly, in healthcare, we badly need one. Okay, and we've got fundamental problems. You know, we were 50,000 nurses short before Brexit, before COVID. Uh, we've got, you know, uh, we don't have enough doctors. Uh, we've got increasing demands on our service that we simply cannot meet. Um, we can't train enough doctors fast enough. Um, and the surgery and the procedures that we performed are, in, are inherently dangerous. They, they cause harm as much as they do good, right? So <clears throat> to keep going the same way makes no sense to me. We have to change. And AI, therefore, is a transformative tool. Will that impact on the way that certain jobs are done at the moment? For example, the way a radiologist reads an X-ray? 100%. Will it change the way that perhaps some of those people that deliver a process in our healthcare systems work? 100% and frankly good, I need it to. Will it replace them? I don't think so. Because I think what it will do is it will enable them to work more efficiently and to work um, more cost effectively and to work more safely. And what encourages me about your statement, your example, is that it's the young people that are having that discussion. Because it's those young people, God, I'm old. Um, <laughs> but it's those young people that are going to lead that revolution. And our job is to educate and to ensure that they're well equipped to, to not just function in that world, but to lead in that world. And, and to me, that's a, a really important because my junior surgeons, my training colleagues or my medical students, actually, they need to have not just an understanding of how to apply these tools if they're going to compete, but they need to understand how these algorithms are developed, how they're validated, and how they, how they work in a, in a proprietary and basic way. And the best kind of example I can give you is pharmacology. Like, I don't prescribe a drug unless I know its mechanism, I know its risk, and I know its benefit. And clinicians need to think about an algorithm in exactly the same way. I wouldn't go into an operating room and use a robot or an advanced instrument unless I knew its limitations and its risk. And, and digital or AI is exactly the same. So yes, it is going to change the future workforce. It's, it has to evolve. I think it's going to enable it in ways that will transform it and make it more efficient and will solve some of our fundamental problems. And I think in my speciality, there will be two types of surgeons. 
I'm going to focus on surgery because I'm a surgeon. But, but there will be analog surgeons and there will be digital surgeons. There will be those that deny AI. They deny its value. They don't engage with it. They don't understand its limitations. They don't contribute to its development. They don't understand the security limitations, the security risk. They don't prioritize that. And they will die. They will be left out. They will, they will no longer compete. And then there will be those that do, and they will become the future surgical workforce. And they will be engaged. They will understand the limitations. They will apply them safely in the correct way. They will uh, leverage them to their maximum potential. And those surgeons will be the future surgical workforce. And I want that because if that happens, our patients will do better. And you mentioned um, surgeons engaging with AI. Um, but it's not just surgeons that we need to engage with it, it's obviously the patients and just people in general. So we learned in the 2023 20, Christmas lectures, which if anyone listening or watching hasn't watched, they should. Um, the best way to improve AI is to feed it more training data. Uh, but when it comes to healthcare and projects such as Indicate, this data is basically representing someone's personal medical history. So how do we First of all, is it a concern for people that it's like they're, because it is a personal topic. And does every person whose data is used uh, need to give consent when it comes to these types of projects? So <clears throat> I think there are kind of two main issues in the question that you've asked. There is the use of information and data, and then there is the application of tools that leverage that data, right? So AI being, being one. Um, <clears throat> and yes, I think there are, there is some concern, and we've seen that in the NHS and we've seen that in healthcare about information being used inappropriately. And we've seen that when very large US organizations come in and with goodwill and perhaps with the right motives uh, um, are, um, given large volumes of NHS information that it gets misused or it, it is not used in the way in which it was intended. And the problem with that is it erodes trust. And this is a game of trust, right? And I say this to lots of companies developing in this space, is that unless you have the trust of all stakeholders, and that isn't, by the way, just clinicians and patients there are lots of other stakeholders that might be the, the healthcare provider you know or you can think about it in terms of um, you know um, the owner of that data or <clears throat> the person that's responsible for managing that data unless they trust what you're doing or they trust these algorithms they, they will they will not scale and they will not apply so the biggest barriers to the adoption of ai or to the to the to to the kind of successful um, use of these data sets are not technical. It's not a technical problem. It's a people problem. It's can you create robust governance systems that are safe yet flexible enough to allow us to innovate and to apply and to move fast enough, right? So they also have to evolve. They can't stay as they are. Can you create the right ethical frameworks that allow these things to be done safely? Can you create new tools that allow us to measure the performance of these AI systems in a way that perhaps old 19th century tools just don't do, right? So is a randomized control trial, for example, the right way to measure an AI algorithm and its effectiveness? I don't know, it's an open question. So yeah, I think these are really fundamental problems. And if we take surgery as an example, right? So surgery is, is unique in many ways because it's a very it's it's a very high risk environment. It's historically been a data silo, so whatever happens, in fact, actually, it's been an analog environment with very little information going in and out of it, actually. And that's why robotics are so transformative because it turns the operating room into a data pipeline that didn't exist before, right? So, but 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 it's a, it's a very high risk environment that requires a team to 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 perform in a very um, a standardized way, but also in a high performance way, much like a Formula One team, you know, changing its tires. Uh, and when it fails, it fails spectacularly, like someone really comes to harm. So how do you introduce an AI algorithm into that environment? What are the ethical um, things that we really need to be considering, the ethical issues that we really need to be considering? And how do we put 
the horse before the cart. And the problem at the moment is that that is totally not happening. The cart is absolutely before the horse. In the rush to introduce AI algorithms, we're not really engaging with stakeholders. We're not ensuring that we've got scalable governance frameworks. We're not ensuring that we've got data standards, data ontologies that allow us to scale these tools. We're not ensuring that there's an open uh, ethical discussion about the implications of these tools. Unless we fix that pretty quickly, we're in trouble. Now, we're starting to see attempts to make that happen. You're seeing the government starting to engage. You're starting to see European legislation come in with the AI Act. You're starting to see the UK start to get its kind of house in order in that. But they've got to do more and they've got to do it faster. So the final question for today, and it is a big one, I'm afraid. Um, will healthcare be better off thanks to AI? So, um, I am an AI evangelist in, in many ways, so I believe it will transform healthcare. Uh, I really do believe that. But I'm also an AI realist. And um, what I mean by that is you should not underestimate the extraordinary nature of the hype cycle for AI. It's unprecedented and it's, it's really beyond any form of precedent, I think. Um, and there are significant barriers to getting to that point. I think we'll get there, but I think there are a lot of barriers. And I think if I if I honestly appraise how I leverage AI in my day-to-day -day clinical practice today, it's pretty minimal. Actually, it's pretty minimal. And so I think what we're really talking about in this conversation is about the application of AI tomorrow. So we're starting to see very exciting applications come. And we're starting to see very significant use cases, particularly in imaging, particularly in radiology, in endoscopy, which is a field that you know, is close to me, or, or in you know, the way that we interpret electronic healthcare records or the way that we you know, synthesize information in medical evidence generation. But those things are not actually being used day to day right now. And I think we also should not underestimate the risk, right? So that is real. And the problem with these sorts of genuinely transformative technologies is that there's what, you know, Donald Rumsfeld will call the unknown unknowns, right? Like you don't really know how these things are going to behave until you properly put them into the real world. And I'll give you an example of that. So when researchers started to apply technologies for um, gastroenterologists who put telescopes inside people to identify polyps, which are early precursor lesions of bowel cancer. Um, what they found was that actually all of, the ti all of their times, their operative times, if you like, got longer. It was supposed to get shorter, but it got longer because the endoscopists were like, oh, look at this, this is interesting, <laughs> right? And they were learning the new tool and actually the technology was finding more polyps than they had previously found and then they had to do things with them. So actually the efficiency of the endoscopy got lower, it didn't go up. Um, but there might also be more interesting and nuanced or perhaps even higher risk consequences of introducing, right? So uh, we don't know, we, we, for, if we look at surgery as an example, we don't have a legal precedent for what happens when an AI algorithm goes wrong and it's gonna go wrong because it will, right? Because all technology does at some point. So what happens when that AI algorithm fails during a surgery? And the surgeon was told by the algorithm, it's okay, you can cut this and they, cut whatever it is that they are cutting and actually it's wrong there's a failure who's responsible um, where does the responsibility lie and what does that not just you know what does that mean for the patient how do we inform and educate patients about algorithms their safety and their limitations and their potential it's not just about the surgeon because it will transfer transform their practice and how they're regulated how they're assessed how they're measured how they're professionally you know um, appraised but also the companies that make these devices so what happens when there's an ai class action lawsuit because the ai algorithm has failed and so actually um, it's very very important that we as clinical scientists and clinicians lead this revolution and that this is not a revolution that's, um, you know, led by industry, right? It, it can't be. We've seen that happen before and, it, and it's failed. It's, it's got to have um, public bodies. It's got to have um, um, 
those clinicians that are ultimately responsible for patient care leading this revolution. I, I kind of really believe that. And I think if we can put those things in place, then actually the future is very, is very bright. I think it's very rosy. Uh, and if you ask me, you know, would I prefer my surgeon to be operating um, with decision support, to, you know, driven by AI without it, I want them, I want them with it. Like you wouldn't get on an aeroplane now if you're going on holiday and you're about to get on your EasyJet flight to, you know, somewhere nice like, you know, Ibiza, you wouldn't get on it because without that computer supporting and augmenting the decisions that that pilot makes and in fact actually automating the majority of the flight, aviation just wouldn't be so safe and 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 surgery and clinical medicine is going to go through that transformation so yeah i do believe it will be transformative in answer to your question yes i do believe that it's going to be the standard of care but i think the journey to how we get there is going to be interesting excellent um james thank you so much for joining me here at the royal institution absolutely my pleasure thank you for having me That's it for this episode. Thanks for listening or watching. We hope you enjoyed James and Lisa's conversation as much as we did. And make sure to check out the first episode of the RI on AI series if you haven't already, where Lisa sat down with the former director of the European Bioinformatics Institute, Janet Thornton. It's also not too late to watch the 2023 Christmas lectures in case you missed them. You can find them on BBC iPlayer if you're in the UK or our YouTube channel if you're anywhere else. In the meantime, head to rigb.org to book tickets for upcoming talks from more amazing speakers.